wanted this morning to look at sort of God's preparedness or preparing of people for the work of the ministry. And it's not just for an individual, this preparation, it's for people as a group. We go back at the end of chapter 9 at verse 32, and I don't want to go through this too much, but Peter was travelling around the country, around Israel at that point in time. And he arrived in, in, in uh, Lydda, and there was a man there named Aeneas, Aeneas, who was a paralytic, and Peter spoke to him. He spoke the words, Jesus Christ heals you, and the man stood up and walked. Now this was something that Peter, that anointing of the Holy Spirit was upon Peter at that point in time, this, this blessing of the Holy Spirit, this anointing, this baptism of the Holy Spirit was there and really in top gear. He knew that God wanted to heal this man. He didn't know probably why he wanted to heal him, but one of the purposes behind it obviously was to, to have an effect on the people around him. But little did Peter know that this would have a big effect on his life as well. Because up to this point in time, Peter had been speaking to Jewish people. He'd never really had a great deal of interaction with Gentiles, which are non-Jewish people, if you want to call it that. So there was word that went around that Peter had healed this man. And further down the coast, in Joppa, there was a, a woman... Tabitha, which is the Aramaic word for her name, or Dorcas, which is the Greek word for her name, but both of these words translated mean gazelle. So we don't know whether she was fit and healthy, whether she was nice and slim, but anyway, that's, that, that was her name. But basically, this woman had died. She was a very kind person here, and Peter had gone down to see her at Joppa, going down to see the people, bring Peter down. Now, notice here that these were disciples that brought Peter down. These weren't just sort of anybody. These were disciples of Jesus Christ. And yet they wanted Peter to come. Now, it's within the remit, if God allows it, for anybody who is a Christian, to pray for another Christian and pray for their well-being and their health. But there was a purpose behind what God had to do with Peter here. He was building Peter, he was preparing Peter for things that were to come just shortly. And so Peter went down and Tabitha, Tabitha was raised up, Dorcas was raised up. And this woman, many believed in the Lord because of this. And so we find ourselves at the start of Chapter 10, in fact at the end of chapter 9 it says that Peter stayed in Joppa with Simon the Tanner for some period of time. Now he must have had a strong stomach because I don't know whether you've ever been near a tannery. But, uh, it stinks. Um, they use all sorts of ammonia chemicals and bull's urine and all sorts of things to tan leather. And I'm not so sure that they still do all that but this is certainly... Uh, I hope his house wasn't the next to his tannery anyway, but here we are, Peter's in Joppa, and he's staying with Simon the Tanner at that point in time. And at the start of chapter 10, we shift up the coast, we go from Joppa right up the coast to Caesarea Maritima, which was uh, the Roman Empire's outpost in Israel, if you want to call it that. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. So here we have this Cornelius, he was a centurion, which meant that he had governance over something between, usually between 80 and 100. 100 was the nominal centurion uh, group, but it could go down as low as 80, depending on whether they were waiting for replacements. But they would never allow it to run under 80. So it was between 80 and 100 normally, they would hope to keep it up at 100. The Italian regiment was classed as one of the most loyal regiments to Rome that there ever was. These were the volunteers, the Italian volunteers. Um, and so this was a great honour for him. But you, what you have to remember here was that Caesarea Philippi, oh no, sorry, Caesarea Maritimo, up on the coast there, up towards uh, 
Sidon, which is in Lebanon, but just below that. Um, this was a place where the Romans had their headquarters. We often talk about Jerusalem with Pontius Pilate and all the rest of it, but Pontius Pilate only went to Jerusalem during the time that Jesus was being tried because they were told they didn't want any trouble in Jerusalem. So you make sure it doesn't happen. So Pilate had moved down to Jerusalem for the time of the Passover feast. This is some five, six, seven years later after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here he is, and the Romans were hated. Now this wasn't just a Gentile as such. This was a guy that was hated. A centurion in the Roman army by the Israelites would have been hated. This is a guy who in some measure wouldn't be able to walk the streets at night without a guard around him because somebody would have knifed him or killed him. That's how much the, the sort of zealots in Israel at that time hated the guys. And here where there's going to be a purpose behind this as well because unbeknownst to Peter, and maybe Peter had changed his attitude but it's unlikely, but Peter would have a, an inbuilt prejudice against the Romans. And you know it's something that we have to be careful as well that we don't end up with inbuilt prejudices that we, that we look at situations and we judge them wrongly and we end up having a prejudice over them. We have, we're going to have the same situation today that uh, we get every time that Rangers meet Celtic. There's going to be a lot of prejudice in Glasgow today and whatever people will tell you in the time that they play this game, if Celtic win then a lot of the Wives of the Rangers supporters will suffer domestic violence tonight and vice versa. And it's virtually criminal that this is still going on. But this is what happens when you allow hatred and prejudice to fill your life. And in some measure the Israelites, they were all like that. They, they may have spoken well about it, but inside them there was this built-in prejudice. They, they didn't like Gentiles. They could tolerate Gentiles. But Roman Gentiles, Romans... These were, the, these were the master race, if you want to call it that. These were the, the guys who were coming down heavy on them. So this was Cornelius. I was, when I was researching this this week, that a lot of people you know, decry the Bible and tell you it's nonsense and all the rest of it. But probably the Book of Acts is one of the best historical documents for that time that's ever been written uh, by Dr. Luke here. But recently within Israel... Up there at the, the, the ruins of Caesarea Maritimo, they have found a stone on which is carved the name of Pontius Pilate. And uh, although nobody was prepared to say too much about it before, it become more evident that Pontius Pilate was some real person and not some figment of somebody's imagination. So this was Cornelius, that's where we are. He's in Caesarea Maritimo, a big Roman garrison there. There's uh, 6,000 in, in a legion, 6,000 men, six, uh, 10 cohorts, uh, sorry, 60 cohorts, 10, 100 men each. And so they're there, and he and all his family were devout and God-fearing, and he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly, verse 2 there. This was a name that Israelites or Jews gave to people who were not Jews, but who accepted their God as being the one God. They called them God-fearers. And, uh, and so it would appear that Cornelius had a, had a name for being generous. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So one day about three in the afternoon at verse three, he had a vision and he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. Three in the afternoon, you'll find out later uh, in the book of Acts that Cornelius, uh, this was a prayer time. This was a time of prayer. This would be one of the three times of prayer that the Jews would follow during the day. They would have prayers first thing in the morning at six o'clock, nine o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, and then that would, that would be their main times of prayer. So this was a time of prayer, and he had had this vision, and uh, he distinctly saw an angel of the Lord who came to him and, and called his name Cornelius. Now, this is not a dream and neither is it reality. It's a vision. 
This is something that he's seen in his mind's eye while he was fully aware of where he was. He had seen this angel. This angel had come to him and spoken to him. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who had spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants and he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. So this was a man obviously seeking after God. He was a man whom some of the Israelites regarded as what they would call a God-fearer. He, wasn't, he would never be put there on the pedestal along with the Jews, but maybe he was a little bit better than a lot of the Gentiles. Although the prejudice against the Romans, I can't emphasise it enough, it was so strong that uh, it would be difficult to break it. And it was going to need a certain situation that God brings about here to get not just the Gentiles accepted into the church, but the Romans accepted into the church as well. So God lays out the first part of his plan here. He speaks to this guy Cornelius and he said there's a man called Peter Simon, Simon Peter at Joppa. He's staying with Simon the Tanner. Go and tell him to come because he has something to tell you. And so in verse 9 we see about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city Peter went up on the roof to pray. So these three guys one of them was obviously a soldier. He was in a, a, a devout a soldier under the command of Cornelius and two of them possibly were servants but they were certainly they would certainly all be Romans it would appear that they were all Romans so three guys on their way and they may well have had other people with them but these were the three main characters who were sent this was 21 hours later from three in the afternoon to noon the following day were 21 hours down the line so at noon the following day while they were approaching the city Peter went up on the roof to pray this was Simon the Tanner's house, so Peter had asked if he could go up on the roof and pray, and this was not unusual. We've heard all the stories in the Sunday school about the little flat-roofed houses. Because they were small and they had not a lot of room inside, they used the upper story, the roof, basically, as a patio. That would be really it. Most of the time, if the weather was good, they would eat outside with an awning over the top of them, because it was, it was too dark inside. If it was really hot, they went inside the building because it was cooler. So they would sit outside. So Peter went up onto the roof to pray, which was his usual habit. And this was at noontime, or around noontime. He became hungry, at verse 10, and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now this trance, this word is ekesia in the Greek. It basically means we take the words ecstasy and ecstatic from it. Uh, he, he fell into some trance that was, was wonderful. It was just something that was literally ecstatic. He was, just, he was just lost in the things of the Lord. I don't know whether you've ever been distracted in prayer. Anybody ever sat down to pray and then suddenly you think, did I close that window? Did I wonder what I'm going to have for my dinner. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm praying, I'm praying. I can't. Uh, you laugh because it's true, isn't it? The, 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 all the time, you, there seems to be this distraction. It's almost as if somebody wants to stop us praying, isn't it? I wonder who that could be. But you see here, Simon was, he was praying and he was hungry. And the hunger was obviously distracting him because... When he spoke to Luke about this, when Luke was writing this down, he, he had said to Luke, he says, I was on the roof, and he says, and this wonderful feeling just came over, and this total ecstasy, this ecstatic feeling. He says, and I was, he says, and I was really hungry. He says, and suddenly, what happened next? He saw heaven opened at verse 11, and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. So we'll get this. I always try to think about it as the wee guys at the seaside with a knotted hanky only maybe bigger than that you know but that's the kind of thing that we're looking at here um, 
So Peter's in this trance, and this, this sheet comes down from heaven. And it contains, at verse 12, all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. <clears throat> and then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that the Lord has made clean. Peter's got this wonderful habit of saying no to the Lord. You know, when, when Jesus told him he was going to be betrayed and they were going to come and take him away, and, he's, and Peter said, never. Do you stand behind me? I'll sort them out, Lord. And he drew his sword and Jesus had to tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. Put your sword away. If it were just a matter of swords and shields, I could bring down a heavenly army that would defend me to the end. <clears throat> and so Peter once again here. And of course, we see him again in, in, in Caiaphas' house in the courtyard. When people say to him, you're one of his disciples. No, me. I'm no one of his disciples. So he's got a good track record for saying no. And here he says no again. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. So, obviously in this sheet, I don't know. It's hard to imagine what he saw. Virtually every type of beast and bird and bug and all sorts that was, that was on the earth. And God told him to stand up and kill and eat. If you're hungry, here's something to eat, Peter. And of course, he's prejudiced again. He was supposed to be a God-fearing Jew so he, his prejudice was that he shouldn't eat some of this stuff. And there was almost a, <clears throat> a total change in this. God was going into a new phase. Gone was the old covenant. And then had come the new covenant. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure which God has made clean. And this happened three times. And immediately the sheep was taken back into heaven. Now this is your homework. Go back and see how many people were spoken to three times by the Lord. I'll give you a clue for one, Paul. When Paul talked about the physical ailment that he had, the thorn in his flesh. Some say it was his wife, but I don't believe that. Uh, <clears throat> I see your fingers getting pointed here. Right? There was, Paul was asking the Lord three times, Lord, will you just take this from me? And three times the Lord answered him. My grace is sufficient for you. So you have a look. Whenever God appears to speak three times to people, there's something serious going on here. There's something that get your ears on because you have to listen to what God's telling you. So this happened three times and immediately the sheep was taken into heaven and Peter obviously came out of this trance state that the Holy Spirit had put him in. It's almost like the same kind of state that Paul was in when he was in the, uh, in the road to Damascus. Only... Paul's was a, a, a live encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this was a vision in some measure. While Peter was wondering at verse 17 about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. And they called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. So notice the timing here. Peter has just been shown this sheet. He's been shown that what he thinks, what he really thinks, is to do, it's all to do with food. But it's not really all to do with food. But he's wondering, what does this vision mean? Does this mean that we're changing our diet or whatever? But while he's wondering this, God brings these guys, these three guys from Caesarea down. And there they are waiting at the gate, knocking on the gate now. You've got to understand that a Jewish house would have a, a small courtyard around it and a big gate. And nobody was allowed in. Nobody was allowed into a Jewish household unless they were Jewish. Nobody. It would have been a case that if Peter had come to see this guy and maybe he hadn't had the vision, they would have kept him at the gate. Normally they would be kept at the gate. These guys were calling out, have you got Simon who's called Peter in there? And immediately when the servants had looked through the, 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 the spy hole in the gate, they would have seen a Roman soldier. A devout Roman soldier. And they would have seen two other guys who were probably dressed as Romans. So here was three Romans. One of them a soldier at the gate of a Jew. And I'm sure Simon the Tanner must have thought, what has this guy got me into now? 
What kind of trouble am I in now with these people? That I'm harbouring some sort of fugitive. I know that I would, that's what I would have been wondering. They called out asking if Simon, who was called Peter, was there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so go out and go downstairs and do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. He didn't tell them what three men were waiting for him, he just said there's three guys down there. While he's wondering, and he's probably still up on the roof, he's hearing the commotion down in the courtyard, he's up on the roof and and while he's still wondering what the hell this is about, the Lord says to him, get up and go down. There's three men at the gate and I want you to go with them because I've sent them. A Roman, three Romans and a Roman soldier, one of them. So Peter went down at verse 21 and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Maybe Peter thought he was going to be arrested. Who knows? But there was something in him, that touch of the Spirit, he just knew. I don't think sometimes God speaks to us in that particular audible voice, but Peter just knew within himself that the Spirit was saying to him, go down and greet these guys because I want you to go with them. He had, a, he had that inward peace about it that he knew that whatever happened, God was in it with him. And I want to put that to you this morning. When God leads you in a direction, it's often... <laughs> I hate to say it's often to a place where you really don't want to go. I'm sure the last thing Peter wanted to do was to be ending up with Roman soldiers and Romans outside his gate. I'm sure that there's many people in here today who are being led in directions that they wonder, is this God leading me? Because we all want to be in a comfort zone in some measure. We all want to just do our own wee thing. But sometimes God leads us into places that we don't want to go. But believe me, if it is God that's leading you, and you have to be sure of that, then he will look after you and watch over you. So Peter went down and said to them, I'm the one you're looking for. And the men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited them into the house to be his guests. So God here speaks to both groups at the same time. It would have been an almost impossible situation for Cornelius to come directly to meet Peter. Because Peter's prejudice against the Romans and maybe Cornelius' reputation about consulting with Jews. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of paranoid people around. I'm sure there were many what would I say, Roman spies amongst the Jews. There always is when there's, when there's uh, oppression in the place. There's always people who are called to be spies, who want to be spies, who want to get the best out of the Roman situation. So God speaks to both groups. And in his own way, he brings about this meeting. First of all, it's with these three people. And Peter is so enamoured by what these guys are telling them that they come from Cornelius. Now whether Peter had any word of the reputation Cornelius had we don't know. But the astounding thing is that Peter invited him into the house. That was the that was the breakthrough. That was the putting down of the prejudice. And the point in this, and I'm not going to get any further with this because I want to do that other study a wee bit deeper next week. But the point of this is that many of the early disciples within the, the Jewish church, the Christians within the Jewish community, would have been horrified if a Jew had gone into a Roman's house or a Roman had gone into a Jewish house. But God had prepared Peter. God had prepared Peter and he had prepared the people. Peter had, and John had healed the man at the gate, beautiful. Peter here had healed Aeneas, he had raised for the dead Dorcas. Peter knew, people knew that Peter was God's man. And if Peter was doing it, then it must be alright. We must go over our prejudices. And so, he invited them into the house. And it, and, it, and it says here that he invited them into the house to be his guests. 
So it wasn't, the, the whole context of that last few sentences there is that it wasn't just a, <clears throat> well, you can sit in the courtyard and, you know, I'll bring you out something to eat. Many, many years ago, before I was a Christian, when I was in South Africa, Doreen and I were invited to a Jewish household for a meal. I've probably told you this before, but but they had a whole set of pots and pans for themselves, and cutlery and crockery, and a whole set of pots and pans for the Gentiles. And they cooked our dinner in the Gentile pots and pans, and they cooked their own in their own pots and pans. And it made you feel really welcome, you know. It was... <laughs> And in some measure here we've got the same situation that Peter has accepted what God says that this is not something to do with just the Jewish people. This has to spread wider and further. And this is where it starts, Peter. This is where it starts. You are going to be mocked. There are going to be people that come against you and say, how dare you invite Romans into a Jewish household? How dare you? And there'll be others who come and say, well, Peter, you know, if that's you, if we feel the Lord's calling you to do, then we'll back you up in that. And I'm sure Peter would have to tell them as well, you have to put your prejudices aside. And it's not just a case of putting your prejudices aside on the outside. It's about the Lord healing the heart. We can't run our lives, we can't allow ourselves to be pulled into a place where when certain things occur, we say, well, I'm stepping back because I don't like them or they don't like me or... I don't like the way they think or I don't like the way they do this. We have to be prepared to say, well, we have to understand first uh, if what we're doing is it, is it unscriptural or is it scriptural. If we're standing against something that's, script, that's unscriptural, then so we should. But if we're standing against something that's scriptural because of our own prejudice, then it's something that we need to get sorted out. God wants to heal the hearts of men. He wants to heal the souls of men. It would have been impossible if Peter had met Cornelius just for the two of them to get together and go into a house to have a meal. God wanted this occurrence and this was to be something you know we'll never really understand. You really need to go back into the history of this. This was a big deal. This was not just well come on in and we'll give you something to eat. We know you've been on the road since yesterday. They were welcomed as guests. They were given a bed for the night. Now for a, for a Jew to allow a non-Jew, a Gentile, and especially a Roman, to eat in his house was bad enough. But to allow him to sleep in his bed as well. I mean, that is just outrageous. That's what people would call it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees would be going ballistic when they heard this. So I put that forward to you this morning. God prepares Peter. And God's preparing all of us. The thing that we have to do is, like Peter, we have to let go of our prejudice. There was a situation here where he showed them the food, but really at the end of the day, kill and eat. Kill and eat the food because the food, if you kill and eat the food, that will give you a door into the Gentile community. You're no longer burdened by the fact that you have to stick to kosher food. The Jews today still follow their kosher diets, etc. And, and if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But they again, if you told them that this had happened, even today, if you went to a Jew and said to him, I'll read you a bit out of the book of Acts here, they would have been, it would have been a disgrace to them. How dare he, that guy? You mean, he's a Jew and he took a Roman. And so that's the point I want to get across here this morning. That let God work in your life. Let God prepare your life. Let God get rid of your prejudices as you follow him. Because sure, as sure as this day is half done, as sure as that, your prejudice will catch you out. You have to let them go. We have to let God work in our lives. And we have to let God do that healing. And bring about the same thing. Let God prepare you because when God has prepared you, then no one can stand against you. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word, Lord. And I pray that as, we, as we're here this morning, Lord, that you would let your spirit fall on us, Lord. That you would just fill us so full of that ecstatic purpose of your spirit in our lives, Lord that we would just know, Lord, that you're dealing with the prejudices in our life, Father. 
whether it's prejudice against people or prejudices against institutions. Lord, I know that in the past in my life, Lord, with my family and my mother and all the rest, that there were lots of prejudices. And I missed out a lot in my young days because of prejudices. This one wouldn't talk to that one, Lord, you know it all. And I'm sure there are many in here the same. Lord, sometimes we have to humble ourselves completely to get rid of those prejudices. So I ask you for that this morning, Lord, that you would bless us this day, that you would fall upon your people, Lord, that you would speak to us, prepare us, Lord, for that which you would have us do. And in that preparedness, Lord, get rid of our prejudice. So, Lord, be with us. Help us to understand a little bit more of what you want to do with us and who we are in you this day. And, Lord, watch over us and keep us as we part for this place. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.